but we saw so far this year is for example stock multiples uh, earnings multiples on on stocks have compressed pretty significantly as you've seen an unusually unusually strong spike in rates uh, you've seen a self in bonds self in stocks um, and the question going forward is okay if rates are topping out maybe the valuation pressure uh, is done now uh, mm-hmm. on some of those uh, companies but then the question becomes what's going to happen to their earnings side uh, if we do encounter uh, either a recession or some type of near recession type of environment uh, and so, you know, I think there's a, a certainly a way to play a top in rates. It could be a bounce in gold. It could be a, you know, drop in the dollar. It could, uh, you know, going long on some of these treasury positions. I think there's multiple ways to play it. So some of the winners of the first half of the year, you know, dollar straight up and many, many other assets straight down. Um, I, I think you could see somewhat of a reversal for some of those potentially. As one measure, you can look at, say, household net worth as a percentage of GDP. And so the higher that is, in some ways, the more financialized that economy is. Um, and so, you know, in the dot com, you know, obviously during during raging bull markets, that'll hit a peak and then during bear markets, that'll be that'll be lowered. So historically, it's been it's been, you know, some some reasonable multiple during the dot com bubble, you got up to like, all, you know, almost four point five. Um, so a household net worth was 4.5 times as high as GDP, roughly. Uh, then, of course, that came down significantly. Then it went up again uh, in 2007. Um, you know, but instead of, you know, in 2000s, it was mostly in stocks, not really in real estate. Uh, in 2007, you had the opposite, where it was not a not a very euphoric time for stocks in general, but it was very euphoric for real estate. And what we saw going into this year was it got all the way up to over six. And so uh, both stocks and real estate and bonds and everything was super high relative to GDP. Um, and so that's that's a quite financialized situation because if you have a big contraction in asset prices, um, you're gonna get a number of factors. One is you're gonna get, you know, the, the top 10% or so are the biggest consumers. Um, and if they, you know, if their net worth is evaporating, they're not gonna, you know, they're not on the margin, they're not gonna be, you know, putting pedal to the metal in terms of things they wanna buy. Um, and then, also, you're likely to get uh, more turbulence in tax receipts. Generally, there's a very strong correlation between the stock market uh, in year-over-year year terms and tax receipts in year-over-year year terms. Uh, and so, in general, I think that the market is very financialized. I think that the the tail's gotten so big that it can wag the dog. Uh, and so, I think I think that's part of you know kind of the softening that we've seen. Uh, and it also makes it, it it's challenging to keep some of the markets liquid when they have that happening. So disinflation for, for people is is different than deflation, it means that, that inf- the rate of inflation is going down. And one thing I've been emphasizing for a while is that even though I think this is an inflationary decade, um, that most inflationary decades have periods of disinflation within mm-hmm. an inflationary decade. Uh, it could be for any number of reasons. Maybe, you know, in some cases it could be because the supply side issues is, is getting temporarily uh, addressed. Sometimes it's because uh, the Fed uh, or other central banks are fighting back and trying to curtail the demand side, which is what we're, we're mostly seeing right now. Uh, and so I think what we're seeing right now is basically an attempt to like hold the beach ball underwater in yeah. terms of inflation. So, it's, you know, do we have more refining capacity? No, do we have, you know, materially more oil uh, and gas production? No. Um, uh, so I, I think a lot of the underlying issues that some of the inflationary pressures are still there. Uh, but I think that if, if you do curtail demand enough, I mean, if you seize up the housing market, which is generally what, what we've seen happen, uh, if you do get a little bit more labor weakness, which we're starting to see materialize, um, then you can start to get uh, disinflationary pressures. And so, for example, if oil you know, went straight up, if that goes sideways for a year, right, that's zero inflation from the energy side. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying that's how you can think of it, uh, where you can get you can get a period of low inflation just because things that went up in price a lot can plateau for a period right. of time until until whatever the next round up is. So I think that um, politics is, is has become more gridlocked and is likely to get more gridlocked uh, after the after the elections. Um, and so I think it's it'd be challenging for them to pass sweeping things. Uh, but I think you could see more targeted types of stimulus, things that like, uh, you know, helping people with uh, food, food and food and energy, right? That sort of thing. So their, their prior stimulus, right? People could, could go and take it and buy like Dogecoin with it, right? So, <laughs> uh, which is not, not exactly what they're intending. So I think that you could see, we're already seeing out of Europe and some states, I mean, they do things like, you know, they'll take the tax off of energy or they'll give people uh, specific like energy stimulus. Um, I think you could see more targeted things like that, especially if you get, you know, ongoing negative sentiment, uh, donors calling up the politicians and be like, hey, you know, 
things are not not great what are you going to do about it right so you can you can, i think you can eventually get some sort of response but i think it'll be more of a a grinding period uh going forward i think i think we expect probably more overall stagflationary type of conditions and you know i i my kind of base case um is that the stock market capitalization to gdp i think we've probably seen the highs for mm-hmm. quite a while and that does not mean i mean you could get higher nominal s p 500 for example um you could get you know basically you could keep grinding up in nominal terms but i think that this the the asset price is relative to the economy you know i think there's a, there's a good case we made that that period of zero rates COVID response you know huge, like b- biggest ever liquidity injection in modern history uh that might have been the kind of a pretty significant peak in terms of how financialized we are and i think going forward i think we're gonna have higher average inflation but again disinflationary periods within that higher average inflation and I think it'd be challenging for asset prices to get as as high as they did, at least relative to to GDP. One of the big things that happened during the past couple of years is, in addition to a surge in demand, people also had a rapid shift in what they demand. So everyone, everyone was locked down, and they said, "Well, let me remod- let me buy a home and remodel it, or let me let me um, get a bunch of electronics or subscriptions." Or and that's that's really hard for goods. I mean, the, you know, the, the supply chain can only support so much at one time. Um, and you had a chip shortage, you know, basically there, I think some of those specific factors, yes, I, I think that, you know, they, many of them already are easing. Right. And I, I don't think we're going to see such a rapid one-time change again. Um, and so some, some of the congestion of supply chains uh, at that peak level, um, I think it's a good case that's behind us. Uh, mm-hmm. I think you could get disinflation in, you know, your, your ability to get certain many types of goods. Um, for me, the more persistent inflationary pressures are on the energy side. Uh, I yeah. think that the uh, supply response on energy is low, um, both in terms of production and then also refining capacity and transportation. And there's more frictions in general. I mean, if Europe has a severe natural gas crisis, they now have a very strong response to go out to the world and figure out how to get more other types of energy sources to bring down that. And that's, that there's a natural response there. If now you're, if you're North American gas producer, you have a, a desire to build some LNG terminals and get them over to Europe because you'll get a much bigger spread uh, on your product, uh, much higher natural gas prices there, for example. Um, and it becomes more economic for Europeans to, to burn other types of energy sources uh, in lieu of natural gas. So it can bring up oil and coal and, and wood, things like that. Um, and so I think that with, with that kind of hole in the global energy infrastructure, uh, I think that, you know, this is an ongoing issue uh, that's not going to be resolved quickly. I think that there's short term types of oil like shale and they can be brought online pretty quickly. You can get kind of these flexible responses. We actually haven't seen a ton out of that, but at least it's, it's possible to ramp that up pretty quickly. But in order to truly bring more supply to market, um, some of those bigger projects like offshore projects and things like that have to be done, which means that an entity has to be able to look out, you know, five to 10 years and be confident that they're going to make a return on capital, right. um, both in terms of oil prices being high and in terms of, of jurisdictions not, you know, changing their, you know, their, their rules or taxes around what they what that company can expect. Um, and so I'm not seeing much supply response really broadly uh, in energy markets. Of course, around the margins, there's always supply response, but I, I see nothing that indicates this is anywhere near over yet.